Welcome to The Kill Count, where we tally up the victims in all our favorite horror movies. I'm James A. Janice, and today we're looking at The Slumber Party Massacre, released in 1982. The Slumber Party Massacre is an interesting addition to the post-Halloween run of slashers from the 80s. On the one hand, the movie's name promises exactly what you get, a group of scantily clad teenage girls getting killed off by a silent stalkery killer, who, in this case, uses a power drill as his preferred weapon of slaughter. But on the on the other hand, this movie was written and directed by women, a rarity not only for horror movies and not only in the 80s, but also relatively uncommon even for movies in general today. Slumber Party Massacre was written by Rita Mae Brown, a novelist and outspoken feminist. She wrote the screenplay, originally titled Don't Open the Door, as a parody of the slasher films being released around this time. The script made its way into Roger Corman's orbit and wound up in the hands of Amy Holden Jones, an editor who had cut some early films by Joe Dante and Martin Scorsese, both fellow protégés of Corman. Holden Jones wanted to branch out and direct something, so she asked Corman to finance Slumber Party Massacre. He agreed, as long as she included the usual requirements for his movies. When you did a film for Roger, there were certain expectations. Tits, butts, and blood. I guess that was the, the way it went. Nudity was more important to him than sex. And, you know, he has to sell the thing. After its release, she actually got some flack for making such an exploitative film, but she's made it clear she has no time for that kind of criticism. But that's the kind of thing women always face, is, you know, it's okay for Scorsese, it's okay for Jack Nicholson, it's okay for Coppola, it's okay for Jonathan Demme to go do exploitation films with Roger Corman, but a woman's supposed to be above that. Well, I'm sorry, that's the way you broke into the business. And props to her for taking that chance, because in order to rewrite and direct this movie, she had to turn down editing E.T. for Steven Spielberg. Although Corman wanted to turn Brown's satirical script into a more straightforward slasher film, Holden Jones brought her own sense of humor to the project, and the result is a movie that's decently funny, somewhat self-aware, and very subtly feminist. Even though the teen girl characters are violently murdered and get naked all the time, they're depicted as actual people, not just sex objects. They're a group of real friends who get along well, drink and smoke, and talk about sports. Yeah, they make dumb decisions, since this is a slasher after all, but they're not totally incompetent or helpless either. Slumber Party Massacre would be followed by two very different sequels, which I'll be covering in the weeks ahead. It also has a weird connection to two similarly named films, Sorority House Massacre, 1 and 2, but I'm not gonna cover those right away. I figure three weeks is enough for movies of this ilk right now. In the meantime, let's see how many slumbering girls get massacred and get to the kills. The movie begins in Venice Beach, California, where high school senior Trish is ready to wake up and strip for the camera. But don't pull that chair out just yet, Chris Hansen. We're all above board here. Mom, I'm 18 years old, remember? This legal adult is going to be left alone for the weekend while her parents take a trip, although she will have her neighbor, Mr. Content, keeping an eye on her. Mr. Content is played by Rig Kennedy, who you wouldn't know from anything besides this movie and a curious special feature on the Blu-ray that's 13 minutes long and all about his life. It's, uh, it's something. <laughs> At Trish's high school, a couple of dudes named Jeff and Neil see an attractive phone repair woman dressed all like Rosie the Riveting. This is another way that Holden Jones injected some passive feminism in a way that wouldn't scare off audience members just there for the boobs and gore. The movie has a phone person and a home repair person, background roles and professions that would normally be played by dudes, both innocuously played by women. I just found that kind of interesting. The boys hit on the repair woman before leaving her alone, which is when she's your Pointed into a repair van and murdered with a repair drill in a denim on denim crime. Not only does this death help pad the numbers to Roger Corman's liking, but hey, now we know that there's a killer around. Not that we wouldn't already know that if we had been paying attention at all. This movie's only five minutes in, but we've already heard about Russ Thorne, an escaped murderer, from both the newspaper and the radio. But those harbingers of trouble have been entirely ignored by Trish and all her friends on the basketball team. So so they're still reveling in youthful ignorance when they hit the showers after practice. This shower scene is one of the most egregious displays of nudity I have ever seen in a movie. The most infamous
this shot literally just pans across a bunch of girls as they turn and face the camera with their chests. And at one point, it even tracks down for the sole purpose of looking at a soapy butt. Amy Holden Jones says the scene was only filmed to fulfill Roger Corman's skin requirements, but even she can't defend how gratuitous it is. I find that the shower scene a little squeamish to watch because it's very pro forma. You can see by the way I did it that I'm like just hitting, you know, okay, you want it, here it is. Here's the nudity, that's it. In the locker room, the popular Trish plans a parentless slumber party with her friends Kim, Jackie, and Diane. She wants to include Valerie as well, a new girl in school who lives right next door to her, but Trish's friend Diane is not a fan. Diane, you're a snob. Hey, only the best people are, you know? Val overhears Diane talking shit, so she runs out of the locker room after declining the invitation. She heard. As the kids leave school, this girl Linda realizes she left a book in her locker. As the driller killer Russ Thorne watches from his newly acquired murder van, Linda, played by 80s scream queen Brink Stevens in her first speaking role, heads back inside the school. After getting her book, she finds the school doors locked, and while she's busy trying to get them open, she's approached and attacked by Russ Thorne, who slashes at her arm with his drill bit. The chase sequence that ensues is honestly one of the better ones I've seen in old slashers, making excellent use of space and pace. There's a great moment when Linda realizes that her leaking blood may give away her location, and she has to stealthily grab a towel to clean it up without Russ noticing. It's a well-crafted scene of tension, but if you can't guess how it ends, you must be pretty fucking new to this channel. Cause any experienced little meaty would know that this early on, the killer will certainly be nabbing himself another victim, even if it does happen off screen. That night, Mr. Content sits with Trish as she waits for her friends to arrive. When they get there, they don't realize the adult is there at first, leading Kim here to commit a slumber party faux pas by breaking out the weed right in front of him. Maui wowie. 100% seedless prime bud. He agrees not to narc on them, as long as they stay safe, then leaves to go home, his herring sufficiently red. Still, I'm surprised that dude's not as creepy as I thought he'd be, especially considering who played him. <laughs> While Trisha's slumber party breaks out the grown-up substances, next door, Valerie's sticking to simple sugar water. She's not spending the night entirely by herself, though, because she's watching over her younger sister, Courtney, who really wishes they could be at the slumber party instead. Courtney is my favorite character by far. She's an adolescent who wants to emulate her sister and the other older teens around her, which is why she breaks into her sister's secret stash of smut. Playgirl, huh? I know an alcoholic writer who you'd get along with real well, Court. Courtney tries to be stealthy with the softcore, but her sister lets her know she ain't being sly. Okay, but do me a favor and don't tear out the centerfold this time. Meanwhile, those dudes Jeff and Neil are making plans to scare the girls, consequences be damned. What's the worst that can happen? I mean, so they get mad at us. They can beat the shit out of us. They sneak up to a side window at Trisha's house and enjoy themselves an eyeful as the girls begin acting out a teenage boy's fantasy version of a slumber party. Damn, Holden Jones, was Corman not satisfied with all those soapy butts in the shower? As Trish orders pizza, Diane goes outside to get firewood and runs into a cleaver-wielding Mr. Contact. You on a snail hunt? Uh-huh, that makes 53 tonight. What? Snail hunting? Is that a thing? My dad goes on snail hunts, too. Oh, all right, I guess it's a thing. Diane heads back inside, and as soon as she's gone, Mr. Content is killed off screen by a drill through the back of his neck. Wait, did the drill bit fall out? How's it still in his neck there? As the other girls smoke and shoot the shit, Diane sneaks away to phone her boyfriend, John Minor, who she calls Boo Boo. Too bad for her, that's not the most embarrassing thing the other girls overhear. Do you think I'm getting better? <laughs> After the lights suddenly go out, the girls go to the garage where they find that Jeff and Neil have been fuse box goofing to give them a proper scare. Aw, this was supposed to be a girls only night, for old time's sake. And now Diane's boyfriend John is here too? There goes that throwback plan, consumed by the wrath of teenage hormones. At least Val and Courtney are still doing a sisters only thing. You mess up my hair and you're dead meat, Val. Is that supposed to be some kind of threat, Courtney? Cause I gotta tell you, it ain't too bad being dead meat. Courtney's still wants to crash the party next door, but Val shoots down the idea again, which means they're gonna miss a very long discussion wherein the girls try to remember the previous night's baseball score. We can't figure out who the runs from last night's game. Say homered. 
We got that. Diane tells the others that she's gonna go to John's for a bit, but it's gonna be hard for her to smooch him when his head can't even stay on his shoulders for two seconds. <laughs> Gotta love a good editing joke. Russ Thorne then attacks Diane, getting her in a vulnerable and symbolic position before killing her with his whirring bit. This kill in particular is representative of the simple and common metaphor that Amy Holden Jones was going for. The central metaphor, I think, of Summer Party Massacre, which I don't know if I even knew it at the time, is about, obviously, a, a virgin's fear of sex. You know, oh no, he's coming at me with that big thing, what's he gonna do to me? As the girls continue to fret over the forgotten baseball score, even calling up their basketball coach, Coach Jaina, for help. We're trying to figure out where the six runs came from. Well, so you got Say's uh, Homer, obviously. The boys go to pay the pizza guy who's just arrived with the doorbell ring. What's the damage? Six so far. Is that like a kill count joke? Because we've only got five victims. Oh, the pizza guy's the six. Yo, get that eyeball missing motherfucker inside the house, y'all. You don't want them empty sockets getting cold. Coach Jaina hears them scream over the phone, but then Russ cuts the phone line, the analog equivalent to using a signal jammer. Since these teens are all jammed up, the boys hatch a plan to unjam them. They're gonna make a run for help outside and go in opposite directions. One of us will make it even if the other one doesn't. It's a nice moment in the movie that gives these fuck boys a chance to be fuck men in order to save the girls. And of course, it fails miserably. Jeff finds Diane's body in the garage, then gets drilled through the back himself, and although Neil makes it to Valerie's house and pounds on her front door, she doesn't hear him over the horror movie she's watching in a scene with some fun dark comedy. Open up! Oh God, Valerie! Russ catches up to Neil and kills him with a bunch of knife stabbings that are intercut with the slasher flick on Bale's TV. It's more great editing humor, which comes as no surprise given Holden Jones' background. And it kinda reminds me of Margot Kidder's death in Black Christmas. Russ takes Neil's body back to his car, but when he tallies up his victims of all his favorite sexy teens, he realizes that he's short one, since Jeff is now desperately crawling towards Trisha's back door. He's hungry for some help, while inside, Jackie is just plain hungry. He's so cold. Is the pizza? Wow, hungry enough to eat some pizza off a dead guy? Gross. They end up hearing Jeff's whimpers for help, but are too afraid to open the door for him before Russ finishes what he started and drills Jeff to death. It's off screen, but it does have some artistic blood creeping underneath the door, so that's nice. A little bit later, Jackie makes a run for the front door, only to open it and find a throat slash with a power drill waiting for her there. I really love the way she falls. It's so fluid and graceful. Kim and Trish run up upstairs and bar a bedroom door behind them. But Russ won't let that be a thorn in his side. He climbs into the window behind them and startles them so much, they run away and leave their knife behind. After dodging everything they throw at him, like W dodging a shoe, Russ Thorne is knocked out temporarily before he awakens again with a moan. Like and he's not one to let a good stabbing knife go to waste, so he uses it to stab Kim in the gut as Trish just barely gets away. That's why you never leave your knife behind, Kim. Having heard some of the screaming going on next door, Valerie and Courtney head to Trish's to see if everyone's okay. But since Trish is hiding from Russ Thorne in a dry cleaner bag like she's little Sally Draper, there's no one around to greet the sisters when they show up at her house. There's a fun little scene in the kitchen where Courtney goes to steal some beer and keeps missing Kim's body in the fridge. It's even got comedic squeaking sound effects. Oil sport. But eventually, Courtney sees the body with a knife in the chest, and the sisters scramble away, with Val going in the basement, and Courtney hiding under a couch. A bloodied up Russ throws the pizza guy's body down the stairs, and then takes its place under the blanket for a little living room nap around. Right as he gets snoozing, Coach Jaina shows up at the house, concerned for the safety of her favorite basketball players, thanks to all that screaming she heard on the phone. And wouldn't you know it, she just can't help herself from checking what's underneath that blanket over there.
It's Russ. A standoff ensues, but thanks to Courtney's interference, Russ Thorne winds up on the floor, getting beaten by the coach with a rubbery-ass fire poker. Trish takes the opportunity to slow-motion run into the room and stab Russ with a knife. But when that fails to kill him, he rises up once again and kills Coach Jaina by slashing her belly open with his drill bit. As Valerie finds Jason's weapon wall downstairs, Russ approaches Trish and speaks to her for the first time, telling her that she and her friends are all soups pretty. I love you. Russ Thorne's actor, Michael Villella, apparently came up with this character motivation himself after reading Helter Skelter. It takes a lot of love for a person to do this. And he ends up sounding like a rapist as he gets nastier and more threatening. You know you want it. You love it. Yeah. That's when Val runs in with her machete. And boy, is she pissed at that lamb. Fuck your life. She chases Russ into the backyard and corners him against the pool where she symbolically emasculates the killer and his driller. Bloop. With the man detooled, Valerie hacks away at his hand and chops that shit off too. He screams at his stump until she slashes his stomach and sends him falling into the pool. But remember, kids, this is the part of the movie where the killer comes back to life for one last scare. Good thing Russ is so incompetent, his final scare ends in him killing himself by running and leaping straight on to Valerie's phallic machete. And that's why we don't run on the pool deck, Russ. The movie ends with the three survivors, kinda messed up as sirens blare in the distance, help finally on the way. How many people didn't make it through the night in Slumber Party Massacre? Let's find out and get to the numbers. <laughs> Twelve people died in the Slumber Party Massacre, and with six male and six female victims, we're cooking in Christie's kitchen and making an even Stevens pie chart. With a runtime of only 76 minutes, that left us with a kill on average every six and a third minutes. I'll give the golden chainsaw for coolest kill to Neil. It's not often a stabbing gets this coveted award, but I like the way this one was edited, and to be honest, most of the other deaths happened off screen. Dull machete for lamest kill will go to Diane, since her death was the most off screen besides Linda's, and Linda had that nicely done chase scene leading into hers. And that's it. The Slumber Party Massacre came out in 1982 and would get a whacktastic sequel five years later. Seriously, check the next one out. That shit is crazy. Until then, though, I'm James A. Janice. This has been The Kill Count. Thanks a lot for watching this Kill Count. I want to thank some patrons like John Carr, D. Orchard Jr., Brett Jonathan Flowers, Koala XS, Vic Graham, Victor Ramirez, and Catherine Rain. This will be the last franchise of the year, so I'm just going to do one-offs until the next year. Also, remember not to expect any more bonus Kill Counts for a while, because I'm freaking tired, man. Thanks, everyone. Be good people.